Welcome to the Experience Focus Leaders Podcast. I am thrilled to host Ben Gutman. Ben is a marketing communications expert and an author of Simply Put, Why Clear Messages Win and How to Design Them. He is an experienced marketing exec. He's ran uh, as a co-founder and managing partner Digital Natives Group for 10 years, which is an award-winning agency and worked with the likes of NFL. Anybody heard of it? I love New York, Comcast, NBC Universal, Nature Conservancy, and now he's also teaching marketing for undergrads at Baruch College in New York City. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Alex. I'm excited to be here. Great. Well, Ben, you know, we love books here, books about communications, marketing. They're probably the things that got us in the journey um, in, um, in in building, uh, relate to, and, and getting the podcast out there and helping people connect through messages that really resonate. And I think you obviously support great causes uh, and supported great causes with your agencies. So let's talk about how do we can you know, help anyone deliver great messages. Let's dive into your book, the framework that you've developed. Would love to hear more. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Dan, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I ran a marketing agency for 10 years and, you know, we would work with all sorts of clients. We worked with small businesses in the beginning, worked with all these big brands and everybody had these really wonderful things they were doing. They had great products. They had great initiatives and programs that they wanted to work on, tell the world. And the reason they hire somebody like us is because they can't, they can't, they want to get it out there, right? They they sent us a big check and they said, Hey, I want you to go have more people know about the thing that I'm <laughs> that I'm that I'm doing. And and in fact, if I interrupt you for just a second, yeah. the pattern that we see is the the more important the message, the more sophisticated the value proposition, the more valuable it is for social success in the world, the typically the harder it is for those folks just to to get it across is that a pattern oh, that you saw yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, and, the 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 most important messages suck the most the the war typically the easier the message the 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 more destructive it is to human society the easier it is to communicate i it, that's exa- that's that's right there i mean i would sit with um clients that have been working in their business for for years right they've been working they've been entrepreneurs that have been doing, you know burning midnight oil for for a decade people who have been in their industry for for multiple decades uh, and sometimes they had the hardest time being able to tell me let alone tell anybody else what it is that they do why it's important and and we would sit there and we would be trying to pick apart and figure out a little bit of what it is. And so, and eventually we would get, get to something that says, okay, well, this is the campaigns we're going to do and it's going to get out there. Um, and uh, what I got curious about was to say, well, why is it, why is it that some things work and some things don't work? Uh, why do some messages get through? Why are they effective? Why do they move people to action? And why are some things um, the opposite, right? Why do we spend a mm-hmm. ton of money on campaigns that don't work? Why do politicians and activists, you know, scream into the void? Why do we in our personal lives have a hard time sometimes getting things across to other people? Uh, and so all ironically, of us, the people that are most important to us, right? Oh, absolutely, right? <laughs> right. Um, like all of us are in this business of yeah. informing and persuading. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like I'm, my background's marketing. Doesn't matter yeah. if you're a marketer, you're entrepreneur, yeah. you're an executive, or if you are a faith. If you're just a human being, right? Like just being, survive right? and get by. We are all storytellers. Exactly. Uh, as a species. And so I began looking into yeah. it, and it turns out that the answer was yeah. simple. The answer was simple, right? Would, and and I put this in the forward of the book. I said, look. It's ironic. I wrote a 208 page book about why you know, about simplicity. Like it sounds like I didn't really take my own advice here, right? So um, simplify it for us. Simplify it for us. What is the what is the simple message? So uh, simple, we define it as it's something that's easily perceived, uh, understood, and acted upon. And so those are the three kind of barriers, right? You have to notice this out in the universe. You have to, um, you know, be able to capture it and and process it. And then you have to be able to say, okay, where, where does this fit into my biography? Where does it fit into my life? What can I, what can I do with this information? Yeah. Uh, and so those are the three, like, that's what you need to achieve. And when you peel back the lid on how, on the things that do that versus things that don't, uh, I found that they all share kind of five principles. And those, those are the kind of make up the different chapters for the second half of the book. Mm-hmm. 
Well, um, you know, it's we'll, we'll dive that. Let's dive into that. But I have to yeah. say, this is music to my ears. Um, and so I think you are a brother from another mother uh, in, <laughs> in this in this instance, because we literally when when we were starting, this is a little bit about us. You know, my other head, I'm I'm founder and CEO of Relate to. We take important documents, presentations, videos, and and bring them to life. Why? Because the more important that they are, the the less they're discoverable, the mm -hmm. less they understood, and definitely they're not acted upon. Right. And <laughs> and so the classical example is some 200 page PDF. Half the time it's gated somewhere. The other half, it's like non-discoverable because Google doesn't read PDFs, right? When you get to it, you can't even understand what's going on because like you're on your phone or, or the table of contents is not navigatable. So you can't get to the parts you may care about. And the concept of a call to action or somehow doing something with what was that thing is almost like non-existent yeah. in the medium of sophisticated ideas. It's like, you know, the best I've seen is people write a thank you at the end of a presentation without anything, right? You know, you know, like, thank no, you. No email, yeah, no just phone find, number. No, no email, yeah. no, like, no number, nothing. Just thank you. Look me up online. Gotta get right? to the void. Because obviously we all have time to do that. Or, or you know, or links to some videos that take you out right. and you'll never come back to that message ever again because you are oh, off to watching political podcast or whatnot. Well, that, that's right? exactly and, what I say is, Everything else is more interesting, right? So, so every ad that you have ever seen, every uh, you know website you've ever gone had gone to for a marketing you know automation platform, whatever, every single time has been against your will, right? You've never been like, you know, what I'm going to do today. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to I'm going to watch some advertisements. Like nobody has ever done that. That that's not how we think that. Oh, our creative is so good, and you know, people want to see the stuff that we're doing. They want to see my report. They want to see my. Um, you know, my, my activist slogan or my warning message, my safety warning or whatever. People care about a lot of things, right? We care about our families. We care about our loved ones. We care about our neighborhoods. We care about our religion. We care about our sports team. All these things are important to us, but we don't care about like your new shampoo, right? Like, but you have to, you have to get us, um, you have to connect that with us uh, in some other way in terms of how does this fit into our lives? Uh, and, you know, you also hit on, I, I just, there. as a, as a warning, I did shower before this, this, uh, <laughs> this, this, yeah. this wonderful event today using using a shampoo of some kind, you know, but probably like you you agreed with you bought at a, you know, cheapest in the aisle versus you know, versus like a recollection of something wonderful. So to your point, but but oh, yeah. so um so this is fascinating. So let's let's you know, let's let's be a little bit geeky and dive into your framework, because, you know, I think the people on this podcast probably are the few people that would look at commercials and that are fun and like would look for lists of most fun nfl ads or or you know super bowl ads so let's go through the framework and how we can apply it in particular probably to the to the types of messages that move the world forward to a better place right yeah the things that are a bit more hefty so absolutely so so the big kind of like um psychological you know uh cognitive science like fulcrum for for all of this uh is the idea of uh, perceptual fluency so we there when you look there's a whole vast uh, uh subsection of kind of the behavioral science research where you look at it and you say it's about fluency which is um in in put simply the well, things in that, neuroscience is co called cognitive fluency probably right like how so yeah there's there's perceptual yeah. processing yeah. fluency yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. it's the things that are easier the things mm -hmm. that are are easier for us to see to hear mm -hmm. to remember to pronounce um to uh, to select and to buy and to all these like they we have a whole host of positive associations with them so mm -hmm. uh, there's an example I, I have in the book. There was a there's a study that what came out I don't know about 15 years ago or so where they looked at uh, stock ticker symbols. Mm. Um, you, you go on you know New York Stock Exchange, Nasdaq, whatever. Um, you know something like Google is Goog, right? G O O G. Um, something like Verizon is V Z, and so it's between two and five depending on where you are, uh, or one and five uh, characters for your uh, stock ticker symbol. And so these researchers said, okay. Does it matter what the ticker symbol is? Mm. And they looked and they they took a, like a thousand companies. Uh, and excuse me if I get the numbers wrong; I don't have it in front of me. They took a, like a thousand companies that had 
uh, IPOs over the course of a certain period. And they looked at ones that had pronounceable ticker symbols, ones that you could say like Goog, right? Like for Google mm -hmm. uh, versus ones like the Verizon one, like VZ that you can't pronounce that take an extra bit of, you know, kind of processing power to be able to wrap your head around. The ones that were more fluent, the ones that were easier to understand performed mm -hmm. better uh, in the initial IPO uh, as a whole than the ones that didn't. Uh, and if you invested a thousand dollars in that first day, you'd have 80 more dollars in the ones that, um, the ones that were fluent versus the ones that weren't. Uh, hmm. and then, you know, that fades over time as more kind of important things begin to, to, uh, affect the stock price, but it still lingers even though through the data. Years, Salesforce it skews it for you because their sticker is CRM and they did pretty well in the, in the, in the world. But <laughs> I, 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 I think that's fascinating. And that's sort of basically because you have a lot of um, trading happening from, you know, retail investors and, that's, you know, folks yeah, that are not as sophisticated. Sure. And so for them, you know, they're not doing the deep analysis of the financials or whatnot. They're just going by the first impression. Um, yeah, I mean, it, basically, it's more it's it's mostly that there are things it was easier to find a home in your head. It was easier for you to see to yeah. read in your mind's eye than uh, the ones that weren't. And for some reason, that begins to accumulate different kind of positive associations. Uh, you'll see there's other studies that about this and uh, that are about uh, like text that is written in a harder to read font, like a blurrier yeah. type thing or uh, one that, you know, grainy or blurrier, or ones that they have in a crisper, you know, cleanly black and white typeface. The ones that are easier to read, people rated those, uh, the subjects rated those as more trustworthy and more intelligent. Uh, when you look at um, like law firms that, or yeah. like lawyers that have, yeah. you know, even when they account for, you know, for race and, yeah. and, yeah. and everything else, lawyers uh, that had uh, more easily pronounced names, yeah. Uh, better in their careers than the, those that had, you know, more difficult to pronounce them. And so all these things, they, they start. All right, to... all right. Let me make this as a public service announcement. Like I'm going to pronounce <laughs> your name, Ben Gutman. Very easy. Uh, <laughs> for me, I think I need some extra help. If you have a minor in Ukrainian language, <laughs> I'm going to do it for you. Shevelenko. There you go. So, no. so now I think hopefully I'm dedicated. I'm applying your lessons right away. No. Um so that's that's uh, fascinating, and it probably comes with naming of of companies as well. Like so, we've mm -hmm. um, we've we've ex we, we we worry about, for example, relate to whether people pronounce it relate to or relate to, and so I have to sometimes explain it's like relay information to someone. Mm -hmm. So relay to, um, but I I kind of like I have a bit of an anxiety in my head that because people don't know exactly how to pronounce the name. It gives them a sense of self consciousness mm. when when introducing it. it. Any thoughts on that? And it's kind of yeah, how... I, you, you, am I am I, I, am I, am I right to be worried? <laughs> you know, it it's um it's a good question. That's a good question. You want to avoid you want to avoid friction wherever you can, right? And yeah. so if there ends up being more friction for someone to do that, then you know there's ways you can style it. There's ways you can you can. Uh, you know, in your own marketing, kind of uh, convey what the what the pronunciation is. Um, I've seen a lot worse, <laughs> than related, so don't 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 worry. Um, and actually, uh, a friend of mine who she she blurred my book, Alexander Watkins. She's kind of the naming expert uh, yeah. in the world. She wrote a book called Hello, My Name Is Awesome, uh, and she runs a name naming agency called Eat My Words. And so I would I recommend checking her checking her stuff out. She has a great uh, model for, for deciding kind of what makes a good name, what makes a, a bad name. And I've, I've even used that in my own practice. Amazing. Uh, so, so I think that this insight of, of fluency, um, I, and it, it, you know, I just want to say like, it sounds like it's very broadly applied, right? It's contrast. It, it applies if you're designing life. contrast, right? Like if you want to create something is movement or attracts, it attracts your attention you know, it, together was good contrast. That's positive. I think one of my pet peeves is we do a lot of um, navigation generation from like, for example, from static content. And so sometimes mm -hmm. people do too many caps, you know, um, because can they sometimes think that like, and you, get, you end up with really long, you know, text in caps, which yeah. is actually, as you know, another kind harder of friction, harder to read, similar to font size styles. Right. And so, um, I'm I'm 
I'm I'm sold. So let's let's keep going. So this is one insight everybody could apply almost in every email you write, every document you you know or, or website you put together. This is a really applicable insight. Yeah. Well, yeah. So that that's kind of like the piece of like science there that drives everything else. Is like you want things to be more fluid. You know, okay. if you can if you could figure there's a million different ways which you can apply them. Um, I have basically in the book broke them down into five major principles. So number one is beneficial. Number two is focused. Number three is salient. Number four is empathetic. And number five is minimal. And I can go into each one of them. Um, but basically beneficial is what's in it for me, right? What, what, you know, of in your message, uh, so what as the receiver, when I hear what, what is the, what do I, how does my life change? How, how am I better off? from receiving your message. If, if this is a, if this is an ad campaign or this is a, you know, marketing, what are the benefits, right? Features and benefits is kind of like marketing 101 people, you know, and this is the thing when you get closer. So what, what, sorry, when you get further away from the customer, as you get, as your product matures, as your brand matures, um, you end up a lot closer to the features and a lot further away from the benefits. Uh, there's an example I use. There's, there's an old advertisement from Microsoft Excel that I, I was able to dig up and they, they're really great. They're really good. Actually. They talk about like the future of computing and like, you know, magic style. I don't want to butcher the exact words and get them wrong, but, but they really focus on benefits about like, what does this do for you and your work? And now when you look at the advertising from Microsoft Excel, um, it is written by somebody so far removed from what that problem yeah. was that they solved that it's just features. It's They're just like ten hey, lookups away from uh, from yeah. from from that. Yeah, that, that. So this is this is like a really common challenge to our audience. So like we work um, with uh, sometimes maybe complex uh, organizations, right? And they they love acronyms, right? They oh, yeah. the acronym, you know. It's, those acronyms don't even spell nice things. Like you said, they are not fluid acronyms. They are tough acronyms. Then the second thing that we see is um, kind of, if you have a complex offering, right? And we've learned this, by the way, this is a good example. Like we learned something amazing from, from Salesforce. They have incredibly complex and broad offering. So so to make it beneficial, to your point, um, they've, they've created an entry point that helped you select who you are. Really quickly, in, in, in one or two clicks, you select exactly who you are as a partner, as an example, and then you drill into exactly what you care about. And it sounds so obvious, and yet so few people do this. And, you know, I don't know, what, what's preventing people from kind of just taking a step back and and putting wearing the the, the their customers or their potential future customers or shoes? Like, what, what's the mental block that you see? So, um, for, for yeah, I mean, it, that, that, that hits upon a couple different pieces actually. And it's so, um, so the next, the next one was focused and the next one after that was, was, um, salient. And then I have empathetic, right? So em empathetic, uh, is the, the subtitle of that chapter is, you know, welcome the enlightened idiot, right? Um, and the enlightened idiot in, in this conversation talking about relay two would be me, right? Like you're the right. expert on relay right. two. I'm not. I, yeah. I've you know learned about it recently. I've checked the website. We've talked about it. It's a great product, but I'm probably a lot closer to your audience. And if yeah. I don't understand, you know, what the, you know, what, what the, you know, the piece on your homepage is, or what your piece of the email, whatever it is, um, that that's more valuable than somebody who is on your team who yeah. has, knows it all the time. You yeah. Know, who's heard me say it 15 times or who's been like, Yeah. yeah. And so, so, so I think some people call it uh, in, in beginner's mind, kind of a Zen concept. Is is this person? another way? Yeah. So, so is do you do you recommend some techniques for for kind of stepping into the into that enlightened idiot kind of uh, the, the, mode? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, I mean, first of all, there's an entire branch of marketing called marketing research, which I mean, I have friends that run agencies there and they will do great work and do that. And if you have a lot of money and a lot of time, you can get a lot of valuable insight from that. But uh, I also lean into the idea of you don't always need that much. Uh, you know, Gallup poll has been running surveys on um, on the state of the U.S., uh, you know, of, of political opinion in the U.S. for about a century. And guess how they guess how many people they use in their survey to make an inference is about 330 million people. Um, I think it's a panel of 500. 
Yeah, just about. They do for they do surveys of four hundred something. They do surveys of a thousand. A thousand tends to be the kind of like their standard one. Yeah. Um, but like you know, if you remember from like statistics class, going back to you know high school or something, you don't need that big of a sample size to be able to extrapolate from stuff. Yeah. Getting five people together that is not that's not your audience uh, is better than getting zero people. It's not as good as getting a thousand people, right? In terms of focus, but but doing something as simple as if you're in a big organization, walking down the hall to somebody who is you know who is not on your team and explaining something, that's great. Um, calling up a friend who's unrelated is great. Talking to talking to your dog, talk, talking to um, your pet. I even suggest listen, take a little post-it note out draw a stick figure on it, stick that on your monitor and explain to them, explain to that stick figure uh, who, you know, what your message, what do you want to say? And mm. little practice alone will help you a lot kind of moving forward. Um, because the real thing is you, we say a lot of things in our own little language when we're writing stuff, especially, yeah. but we talk a lot more than we write. And we're really good at talking. I think Seth Godin had a piece about this once that was, uh, you know, nobody ever gets talker's block, right? We get writer's block, we get talk, talker's block. <laughs> Our talking muscle is really strong. Uh, and so it's really obvious when people are saying something that sounds like they wrote it. Like, you know, there's that's why we give, you know, Oscars away to people who are good at saying things that, that were written that we believe, right? Uh, most people are pretty bad about saying something authentically that was written some you know the the for them and right. uh and so just talking it out if it sounds weird when you're talking to somebody yeah. then it's gonna then it is weird it's much better if you talk out your idea grab that little fragment of a sentence that was yeah. really great put that on your website instead of being like oh here's some you know uh, i pulled these buzzwords out of a hat and i put them on there because this feels like the right thing well, and I think the the joys of Zoom is that you could just record yourself right yeah. listen to how you talk how you come across and sometimes that's great for research, but it's, it's even that is a is already an improvement because um, I sound like a schmuck half the time when I kind of uh, when I listen to myself in, in my in like in my first impression, but when I say it, I sound like a genius, you know. I'm like oh, yeah. I'm all there. So I think it sounds like that's in the same in the same vein, like like just kind of get a little bit of a feedback loop, whether it's from yourself or from somebody else. Just enough feedback. You don't need yeah. and you, you, know, you don't need feedback. You don't need to, you don't need to do uh Ipsos need to do, or or Gallup research. Got it. A hundred. You know, they they like exactly. And you should always look at feedback uh as kind of like a thermometer, not like a, a not a guide. You, you shouldn't yeah. be following it to give you insights, but we're using it more as kind of a, a check. Okay, this is the thing I want to say. Is it actually conveying what I want what I want the receiver to understand? Yeah. And and I think this is sort of the big gap that we all have in our communications, right? Because I, I think we just need to have that image of the receiver, right? Like that's the, the stick, stick figure, because I think that we're just kind of, you know, there's this almost socially, actually, there's a, um, uh, I, I guess, you know, there, there, there I'll, I'll go on a bigger topic. I feel like there's a pressure to express ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. There's kind of like, and there's a lot of tools that help you express yourselves, right? And and so we kind of have a culture of selfies, right? That's like I'm expressing myself, I'm showing myself. But I, you know, I I wonder if people kind of go through um, the longer term implications of like, what is this expression about? Is it about expressing myself because of you know my ego and narcissistic needs, or mm -hmm. is it or or is it expressing myself to to actually you know connect with the other human being right or connect was a was a was a mission or a message and and to your point back to you know action right like is is the expression going to lead to behavioral change and one of my personal pet peeves is that we are we kind of are a culture sometimes of outputs but not of outcomes mm -hmm. um and it sounds like a great communication. Simply put, you know, communicated was your was your kind of vision in mind. Actually, has a higher likelihood of getting, you know, getting from an expression to an outcome of some kind, right? Is oh, that? Yeah. Uh, do, do you have any statistics on that as well? And kind of, what are the, you know, what's preventing people to think, uh, especially creative people, actually, rarely, sometimes, get zeroed in on the outcomes. Um, 
um, and it's mm -hmm. maybe like the business and creative people like yourself that have to kind of bring them back, right? Like guide us a little bit on that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that that is part of the reason you know, I put that right in the introduction about like, you know, why why I wrote the book is that communication is important, right? It, it's 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 easy to think that, oh, well, you know, marketing is just marketing. It's a whole, you know, yeah. I, I don't need any more commercials or, you know, I, I don't need any more sloganeering from the from a politician or whatever. Like, that's the whole reason we're here, right? Like we we are here to connect with other people and with, um, you know, and to make change in the world and to make all the you know, make all these things better and so that is the important stuff and so many people struggle when they're trying to actually do that um you know it's communication is cited as the communication problems number one factor in divorce um you know communication is uh the is the cost of communication i think is something i i forget the stat in the book but it's something like you know 400 billion dollars a year or something like that in, in uh uh in um uh, in economic loss for for not commute for for miscommunication uh it's the number one and when you say miscommunication it's it's sort of again a combination of like i communicated but nobody read it yeah or or well, seen it right like or exactly. i communicated i thought i communicated one thing but actually the few people that did get to it completely didn't get to that part that i thought was really important and well, then there was yeah. no outcome you know, the few that did listen, like tiny percent got mm -hmm. that communication. They were like, got distracted midway through it and didn't do the one thing I really desperately needed them to do. Is that kind of the loss of communication that you're describing? Or is it like, are there other components there? Or is it like just um, people talking at each other is another one? You know, so you I, can... I would say, um, you know, that, that, that ties back to something which, I, when I was putting this book together and there's pieces of it that like, were like, okay, this is very visceral and I've seen this before. Like, this is a chapter I know I want to write. Um, but then there's the piece that is not like, so it's, it's almost, it feels like it's duh. Like it's, of course, like this is what it is, but there were two pieces um, in the book. I simplify everything appropriately. And I say um, there's senders and there's receivers and then there's the message in the middle. And um you know, senders could be, we're all both of them, right? Like in this conversation, I'm sending right now, you're receiving. Um, and a minute ago is the other way around. And then for people who are listening to us, it's we're both sending and they're receiving. Uh, the, you know, so we have to understand like where our responsibilities are in each of those, uh, when we have each of those roles. And then the message is the way I, I frame it is it's not words. It's often represented by words, but it is the idea that's behind the words. It could also be images. It could also be, it could be sounds. It could be, it could be feelings. Um, anything that kind of hits those. It could be the frame, right? The frame, like I think the the setting. Um, mm -hmm. be, be, yeah, ups, okay. Yeah, so like this book is not, it's not a style guide, right? Like I'm not, uh, I'm not an English professor. I'm not here writing, you know, like this is the word to use. This is not the word to use. Uh, it's about how do you kind of frame that thing that's the message and make it so that it is an effective communicator that goes from the sender to the receiver. Um, and I also, you know, want to make sure that that I always lean on the idea that it's the responsibility of the sender. Just like when you send a letter, you're responsible for the postage. It's the responsibility of the sender to make sure that the message is something that can be easily, per you know, perceived, understood and acted upon. I think this is genius. And I think it's, it's, um, you know, we, we, we even share this with our team internally. It's sort of the sense of ownership, right? Like it's like, you're, you're accountable. If you're doing sales enablement, you're accountable for getting the right sales content to the team. Do not blend. Oh, those silly salespeople. They are just not paying attention mm -hmm. to my brilliant marketing stuff. No, it's, no, this is marketing's number one responsibility to get the sales team fired up using the message. Same thing. Oh, those customers are reading my brilliant 20 page ebook, white paper, you name it, on the topic X. Well, you know, you they don't need to. They don't barriers, want to. <laughs> right? Like, this is your responsibility. Yeah. You, you, and, and the, I think you, we, we, we have a, use a, our own buzzword kind of like a buyer experience, right? Like, but you're like creating barriers there. Whereas your job is to kind of, you know, make it fluent, right? Like remove, remove the barriers and make it fluent. So I think, I think this is really important. And it's funny. I would say um, even people who are in the business of communications, 
sometimes lose that sense of ownership, right? Like it's just kind of reminding oh, yeah. ourselves, right? It's just something about a human, right? Like, again, like you get so excited as a creator, you kind of like forget to, to test if the loop is working. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, uh, there's something I would see a lot. So my, my, I, my background, I, I, uh, have, uh, I've done a lot of design in my career as creative director, as a designer. Um, and when I talk to designers, I can always tell you the ones that are, that are going to make it or that are not going to make it. Uh, it's the ones that think that, that this is, that the client is stupid or that the user is stupid. If they think that in this like derogatory way where it's like, oh man, I had such a great thing and somebody, you know, didn't use it right. Well, you're, you you have, it's about users, right? That's yeah. what design is about. Yeah. Is you it, missed the point. <laughs> yeah. Art's about you, right? Design yeah. is not art. Design is yeah. business. Yeah. Art is about you. Yeah. Design is about saying, how do you accomplish something in the world with, by you arranging something, right? And that could be user experience, it could be fashion, it could be whatever. And, um, and so when a designer is not focused on that, when a designer is saying, yeah, you know, like, you know, I, it, but it looked really good. This was the thing that looked really good in my portfolio, but I'm like, well, how did it work? Like, did uh, people use yeah. it? Did it, did it sell oh, more widgets? Oh, did I'm it, supposed to ask that? Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> well, I think this this is fundamental, actually. And I think we, we there's a change in the mediums. And I think there's some design, like particularly graphic design, that still comes from a world that was very far apart from the outcomes, right? Like there were kind of multiple steps between the designer and the the and recipient. And yeah. then there was kind of, we live in a very different world where, where right now where, um, for example, we at Relate to, we promote interaction design, right? And like, if you think of like interaction design, that's where you take the graphic designer with those beautiful, you know, Adobe skills, you know, maybe now with the help of AI, even more beautiful, yeah. right? Faster at least. Right. And they're they're competent, right? Like they are probably, you know, very capable if they know how to use those tools. They've been trained. But the their superpower is data driven design, right? It's like basically observing what's the interaction, tweaking, testing, and so on, or um, or at, at least moving in that direction, because that's what really, you know, creates a connection. I think we we one of your points is empathy, right? Like, so how do you, you know, empathy like it, like the, the interaction by definition implies if there is an interaction it implies yeah. some kind of empathy so i think this is you know ties into uh, this broader change in the in the mediums of communications and what do you think that's doing right like you know marsh mcclellan obviously crafted the medium as the message um and so when you talk about the message you know how does it adjust for for us, it, you know, we we obviously are experience focused leaders. So for us, we believe experience is the mm -hmm. the message, and experience combines the new medium, but it's it's even broader, you know, it, you know than that. Uh, guide us a little bit on, you know, what you've observed, and obviously you work, you know, you, the the name of the the company you founded was Digital Natives Groups. So to guide us a little bit on that and how that differs uh, across mediums. So. Um, part of the reason that I wrote this book now was we're living in this little moment where if you look at every major platform, you look at um, all the browser companies, you know, Apple and Google and Mozilla and Microsoft, um, and you look at the, you know, Apple and Google also run the mobile operating systems. They are all pushing in the same direction, which is basically the death of the cookie, right? You know, the, the cookie is this Little for those who I'm sure most people on the you know podcast here will understand what it is, but it's a little tiny you know file that lives in your computer that tells the website you've been there before, uh, and that's how you get all sorts of retargeted advertisements. Um, you know, you look at hiking boots one day, and then hiking boots follow you around the internet forever. That's that's the simple. The version. joys, the joys of our existence. So, <laughs> so all of these. I mean, when uh, on one day earlier last year. Uh, Facebook stock dropped twenty percent because of fears over the the death of the cookie. Because Facebook is an advertising company, right? Um, and they don't own the platform, right? They don't own the browsers, they don't own the operating systems. They're, and so that's like the clearest barometer for like, okay, if we think things are going to be less effective because because of these changes. Um, that's the company that's going to be hit the hardest. And um, 
the the thing about that was blunt force stuff does work, right? Like if I hit you over the head with an advertisement a thousand times, mm -hmm. eventually you're probably going to go out and buy that that pair of hiking. Mm -hmm. It's just like it, but that tool doesn't work anymore. Um, mm. it won't, it's in the process of dying and it will, you know, it won't work at a certain point. The thing that was that kind of cheat code for everybody in, in business and marketing for the past decade, 15 years or so, um, you know, won't work in that next generation. And so you have to go back to like what worked before, right? Like what works, what, what works with humans in general. And that is how do I put together something that is an effective message that communicates that, and that persuades. Got it. So, so you're back to the art, and versus versus uh, as an entrepreneur giving money to Facebook mm -hmm. and and Google Ads. Well, it's more so. I mean, art's tough. I have a ton of respect for art, right? Like I have, yeah. I have artists in my family and stuff, and I yeah. there. But and I, I like to always frame this stuff as this business. It's this it's about business. solving problems, and the the thing about this is it's the harder part right it's if there's there's like the message in the vessel right there's mm -hmm. the message, what you're saying how you want to you know like like what's the slogan you know what's the tagline all that stuff um and the vessel is all the different ways which you get that to somebody right you get that through facebook ads you get it through yeah. a super commercial a direct mail piece whatever um and the vessel stuff is where like most people will spend their time it's where right. most people, where most jobs in marketing in a marketing department or marketing agency are spent on the vessel. The smaller part, the biggest budget, the biggest budget uh, is typically on the vessel, right? Yeah, um, and yeah, and so there's no disrespect to any of that, but like that is a lot more functional. Of like yeah. you, you can learn that stuff. Like that, it's empowering. Yeah. Right? You can go out and you can yeah. get get some certificates. And you can learn that stuff, and you can be a real expert in that. Stuff. But there's not enough attention paid because that works so well a lot of that vessel there's not enough attention paid to the contents of it to and the that's of it yeah. yeah and so that's you know how do we how do we kind of build models and and look at that because that is harder to figure out that other stuff the vessel is dealing in like black and white right you know if an ad worked or didn't you know it got displayed or things yeah. but the the contents were harder to um you know, our, well, our this customers. really resonates like i think one of the customers said like you know that really struck was me uh, it's a CMO is like, we're spending gazillions of getting customers to our ebook, to our white paper, whatever, like case study. And then, you know, like through all those channels, we master the channels. And then when they land there, like, we, it's like, yeah, you know, it's just the, the message is not obvious. It's not clear. Yep. The wrapper, you know, for, from the way they value us is that we un help on, un you know, unpackage the package around it is beautiful then you open it then there is like this beautiful tagline or whatever it is the the what's in it for me was emotional resonance that's focused and so on so it makes a lot of sense so on that note let's do a little bit of a fun exercise mm -hmm. what are some of your favorite brands and what do you think they're doing right and maybe you know some of the brands that you really don't you you, you like but you wish they were doing something different about how they communicate it you know, um, you start a few and then we, maybe we'll cold call you on, on one, one or two as well, just to make okay, it that, fun. That's hard. Um, okay. So, you know, it's funny in my class. So I teach, I teach marketing at Baruch College. I have a bunch of undergrads that come in every year and I have them as their first assignment, like pick a brand and mm -hmm. have them develop what the brand essence is, develop what the, you know, the positioning statement is, all those things. And I give them this one caveat on the assignment. I said, don't choose Apple. Like, because yeah. Apple's too easy. Apple yeah. is, uh, it's the biggest, it's such an outlier. It's the biggest company, yeah. you know, depending yeah. on the day, it's the biggest company on the planet. Um, it is, they make all the profit in smartphones. They have the most yeah. successful product of all time. Like it's a different animal. Like, and they, yeah. and so it, it's also useful. I tell for them to go into conversations for their internships, for their jobs, to not just have Apple as like the example, because yeah. like they have something else. Um, I mean, but that being said, I think that there's a handful of brands that are very, very, very good at almost everything they do. And, and I think Apple's one of them, right? I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's, um, I think right now, some of the most interesting brands, and I I don't know, I feel like I don't know enough about all of these that have a super deep conversation on, but I think Yeti and Liquid Def are both, they're kind of in the same, a um, little bit in the same market, but are some of like the most interesting brands that I've seen in the last five years kind of take off. Um, Tell us more. 
So, so do you know do you know what Yeti is? The, the well, let's assume let's assume the audience okay. is new to Yeti. Okay. So, have you ever bought a cooler in your life? Yes. Yeah. I, <laughs> I will so, speak for the audience. I, was being, I don't okay. remember when. <laughs> yeah. It clearly was not an emotional decision. At and the if time, you bought but... the cooler, you bought you bought it at like Walmart or something like that, and it you know it lives in the back of your garage, or you know if you live in the city, you probably just have some tire from one. You bought it at a bodega, right? You haven't spent that much time thinking about your cooler. Um, and if you bought it at Walmart, you you spent thirty bucks on it, right? Mm -hmm. It's the Coleman out, out there. Coleman, makes, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. Coleman, yeah. Coleman makes coolers. They've made coolers forever and they're yeah. pretty good, right? Yeah. Um, but Yeti comes out and says, hey, we're going to make a cooler that's going to cost $300. And um, and the cooler is going to become like a status symbol. We're going to invent a new category. That's the luxury cooler market. Uh, yeah. And it's good cooler, right? Like they're like, oh, you put ice in it and you go, you go back country, you know, uh, off-roading for a week and you still have ice in it at the end of the week. Um, and so it's like they they are high performing products, but um, there are it's other the NASA NASA of coolers. Yeah, you know, okay. there are other high performing products out there <laughs> that are not as expensive as what they are. But they basically said, okay, well, we're gonna you know we're gonna be in the market of people that want to you know show that they are like serious about their outdoorsing, uh, and that are willing to throw money after you know after mm -hmm. things that. Um, and so they they invented this whole new category and then they own it for themselves. I mean, it's like a little bit of the, like blue ocean strategy type stuff, right? And no one, there were there was no luxury cooler. They invented mm -hmm. the luxury cooler. Um, and when that's where they started, and you can still you can go buy five hundred dollar, eight hundred dollar like giant one, or the thing that they sell like the most of is going to be like tumblers. Mm -hmm. You can buy a, a mug. I yeah, you know, I don't have it on my desk here. I have a I have a Yeti tumbler that I got. Um, it is great. And then they also have things like, you know, chairs and, you know, other things that make sense, but then they have dog dishes and they have a $50 dog dish that you can buy. They have a $50 bottle opener that you can buy. Uh, and they're making money hand over foot because they're talking about, you know, they're, they're talking about, uh, they're talking to a market that didn't really have this stuff. And they're, they're positioning themselves as a status symbol item that people just want to get a souvenir from that company. They might not be able to afford the $300 cooler, but uh, they want to see. afford the $20 little, you know, $30 little tumbler. And it makes them feel like they have part of that. Um, and so this, less, this is less of a messaging piece in there. It's just more of kind of, of like of, of how they're doing their brand experience than anything else. Um, but it's like Harley Davidson. So Harley Davidson, there are people that have Harley Davidson tattoos that don't own a Harley Davidson. There are people that buy Harley Davidson. Oh, I didn't know that. That is yeah. that is actually hilarious. I knew about this tattoo story, but I didn't yeah. know that it's a it's a non-owner tattoo. Yeah. And, there are people uh, that, that buy yeah. dog leashes and, and belt buckles and and you know, like like folders for elementary school students that don't have uh, Harley Davidson, and because people want to get a souvenir of the brand, because the brand says something, it means something, and so and so that that's really the um, you know that's almost an example of kind of that wordless message a little bit of like what what is it you know Harley Davidson the whole thing is about like a uh, new generation of cowboys you know like that type of uh, attitude this kind of Americana piece um, and so how they want to get a piece of that then and what um, are, that, what are great brands that are failing right or historically great brands what do you think is sort of oh man. Uh, um, I mean, I think, you know, we can talk about Twitter and X, you know, <laughs> for a little bit of you interested well, in that. Like, like, like I mean, well, you, we could talk about that. We could, uh, that's topical. I mean, I think Tesla is an interesting example, obviously, um, of at least how it came up as a great brand. I think, you know, you know, at some point I was like, yeah, we're the Tesla of, uh, we're building the Tesla of uh, documents and presentations right like so we, like now it's you know there's some mixed feelings about the brand but that's relatively new but like what's your take on x and um uh and twitter rebrand from a from a kind of marketing science perspective yeah um it's funny i i at some point have used also like the tesla of x or y or something in in um uh in different like you know brand comparison you know yeah. branding guidelines uh here's the thing twitter had you know not just like 15 years of brand equity that everybody you know knew it because they used it and stuff. uh it was one of like three or four companies that everybody else put that logo on their own stuff so mm. everybody's website 
And I don't know, you know, off the top of my head, your website, my website, my old ANC website, we all had the Twitter icon on it for mm. years, for the last decade plus. Every website for every company had a little Twitter icon on it. People put business cards, printed their own business card to put Twitter icon on it. Uh, it was a little square that was on everybody's phone. It was something that people put up billboards for their movie or whatever and had a little Twitter icon on it. You couldn't buy that. That is not a piece of brand recognition that you could buy for if you spent all the money in, in the world. Uh, mm. And go ahead and, and kind of immediately wipe that away by changing the name, changing the logo, changing the colors. Um, I I think is a is a very foolish uh, very foolish move. What do you Interesting. think? Interesting. I haven't thought of it from that point of view. Um, I think it, it's a it's an it's a fresh perspective uh, for me, and I think it's a great perspective because it is the sort of placement. Uh, I hope they come up with a clever mechanism for at least um, modifying the Twitter icon. And embeds, uh, you know, automatically. Um, you know, I, to, to me, I, I, I you know, I, I think I'm not a Elon Musk hater. I would say in, in general, mainly because I've seen what, um, uh, what, what, what I really admire uh, is just kind of the the approach taken to Tesla, right? Like that, I think like building a brand without any marketing. Uh, and so there's something that I, I have, think he has some inherent understanding of how to create an experience and a conversation from out of nothing or like now increasingly less so. So, I, you know, X is obviously like a lifelong dream for for somebody, right? And they're kind of the... I mean, he's, been, he's been trying to use that name forever, right? Forever, <laughs> right? Like, so I think this is sort of, you have to give people credit for just going, you know, like, hey, I just don't give a shit. You know, I'm just going to go go big or go home and go pursue this. And I think oh, yeah. this is his mindset. And it's part of what, what the recipe of the, of the success is. Right. But, um, but I, it's, it's um, definitely brand equity wise. This is not a, this is not a normal calculus. I would agree no. with you. And I'd I wonder if there was a smoother way of doing that. You know, that's probably without a doubt, that is probably like where I would agree that I would think there's a Twitter X or something like that, or like, you know, uh, some transition period that, could be done that that would uh, move yeah it was done you know the, the darkness of night right <laughs> it's done, done kind of a, yeah yeah but, i think the there's some some things are too precious to be done sloppily and like i think the people understand that i think in the physical product realm like so i think teslas do have a you know quality standard that they maintain but that was not built overnight um and oh, yeah it, it and took I, a lot of work and i think here there's a perception that it's a digital brand so you could just do whatever the hell you want right and Meta was almost the same level of, um, you know, consternation, you know, frustration, and and the way the the metaverse is is looking right now, we you know, which we support, frankly, right? Like, you know, we have browser, you know, you could play our content in metaverse, but like, the, unfortunately, not too many people are are doing it. So that was also like an example of a uh, probably a mistake in the in the retrospect. What's your thought on that? Uh, I think so too. I think that the, um, you know, first of all, I mean, tw Twitter was already, uh, if you go back to that for a second, uh, tw Twitter was not a well-run company to begin with. <laughs> so I think that, you know, I, I was open-minded in terms of saying, okay, then maybe there's something interesting to do here. But um, I, I think that this, this was a, a confusing decision for sure. But going back to the other pieces, um, in terms of naming, you know, talk about like fluency and things being easier, like everybody understood what Facebook was, right? Like that was that was very straightforward. It, it's it's a physical object that existed in some colleges and and it kind of described what it was. Uh, Meta as a name change for that company uh, felt a little bit kind of meaningless and it felt a little bit, you know, kind of that was always a fuzzy idea. Talk about difficulty in communicating when you look at any of the companies or individuals that were really pushing stuff in the metaverse over the past year, um, it was not simple communication. It was something that was uh, often just like, I'm gonna grab a bunch of the buzzwords that are around and I'm gonna like kind of shoehorn them into one thing and 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 something's gonna fit, right? And there's in the, um, you know, in the chapter on focus, that, that's called like the fighting the Frankenstein idea. And the Frankenstein idea like is something, it. you know, you've probably seen, 
in your life a thousand times. I've seen it, you know, in, in both professional setting, I've seen it with my students a lot, which is, you know, there's five people in a group, person one has an idea, person two has an idea, person three has an idea, person four has an idea, and so on. And there, there's no clear leadership. They're just kind of like, well, you know what? I don't want, this is good. This is okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to take them all together. We're going to wrap some tape around them. Yeah. And we're going to put it out there is we're going to do, we're going to do the metaverse and we're going to do drones and we're going to do, you know, um, web three royalty card. Yeah. Like whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And there's going to be all these different things. That's kind of what the metaverse really felt like in terms of whatever I, I didn't hear anybody communicate, articulate, a very strong vision that wasn't a version of that that wasn't just like it's and 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 instead of it being you know so so there's there's a little tool i put in the book which is if you want to test if your idea makes sense replace the ands with so's and so you say interesting yeah uh i'm doing this so i'm doing that or like we have this goal so we do this thing because when you use the word and it doesn't trigger anything in your brain. It's a proper grammatically correct English sentence to say X and Y, right? We're going to, we want to uh, increase return customers to our coffee shop. Uh, and we're going to launch a metaverse concept. Sounds like something that is grammatically correct. There's no, no warning signs go up. But if you say we're going to, we want to increase return customers in our coffee shop. So we're launching a metaverse concept. But like, wait a second. The, how does that relate to the previous one? Uh, how does that tactic relate to that goal? All um, right, let, let me put myself on the spot. So I'm going to try this to do for for myself. So, yeah. um, uh, so I, I don't know if the audience knows what we're doing at, at relate to, but uh, uh so I'll, so relate to turns um, conventional documents into awesome websites so that anybody would be able to succeed with their ideas. That's a lot closer to to the home run than than uh, than anything else, right? That, that's probably probably, probably the, the the mumbo jumbo I put together on our website one day. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, and so, so that's that... really helpful. So this works. Everybody, yeah. check out Ben's <laughs> book. Yeah. And the newsletter, right? There has tips of of this kind. Ben, just one quick promo for you. Where can people yeah. before we forget? Where can people find you? And um, you know, what, 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 where can they sign up to get the book? Uh, tell us a bit more. Got it. So everything for me is going to be at bengutman.com uh, and nobody spells Gutman right. So it's Ben Gutman, B-E-N-G-U-T-T-M-A-N-N, two T's, two N's, dot com. Uh, and there's, I do send a newsletter out every Tuesday. Uh, people seem to like it a lot. That's, you know, something I call three simple things. One thing for me, one thing for somebody else, and then one idea. Uh, and I've had a lot of fun doing that. I've, I started that about a year ago and the book comes out October 10th. Uh, it's by Barry Kohler Publishers. It'll be wherever books are sold. Um, and you'll see that if you go to bengutman.com or simply put book.com, uh, it'll be right there kind of on the homepage. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to get it out there. I'm excited to, um, you know, to share this with more people. If anybody, you know, has any questions or wants to reach out, my email's on my website and, um, you'd love to hear from you. Super. This is amazing. Ben, before we go, what's your parting words of wisdom? Kind of the, the simple takeaway for our audience about what um, what they could start doing tomorrow or even today that's different, that's going to help them succeed with their ideas. Besides using Relato, of course, you know, which, so which that, is our plug. <laughs> so yes, of course. Uh, you, you mentioned the word help in there. So another little tidbit that was in the book that I, I like a lot is you can generally remove the word help from your marketing vocabulary. Uh, people don't want things that help them do stuff. They want things that do the stuff. So the toothpaste doesn't help make your teeth whiter. The toothpaste makes your teeth whiter uh, is a lot stronger way to communicate that. Love it. And, uh, yeah, the lawyers might not like that. Your compliance people might not like that, but you know, go to bat and try to try to simplify that part as much as you can. That's really helpful because just, just that for the audience sake, I just use that in my in my uh, in my in my glory and excitement i use that without <laughs> even being completely aware of the drawbacks of using that word that is actually fascinating ben uh really fun conversation thanks thanks for sharing your insights with our audience and everybody i hope you go to bengutman.com and uh go go get your goodies there thank you ben appreciate it thanks so much alex